Well, well, well. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun, isn't it, Callum? Not Jim, to it, man. No, no. Um, but um, good to have most of you along for tonight's live episode over on the Red Tinted Glasses YouTube channel. Paul Donaldson, one of our regular viewers on YouTube, saying um, hi to both of us, saying some group therapy much needed tonight to get us all through the trauma of what happened the other night. And I think trauma is a fair assessment um, because there was definitely some recovery needed after that mm -hmm. late blow. And Jim Goodwin come said after Aberdeen won at Motherwell that Aberdeen is a very emotional city regardless of the result. And I think we've seen a lot of emotion, especially since after full time on Saturday, carrying through into what happened on Tuesday night. You calmed down yet? Not really. Uh, I had avoided watching all of the goals back until now, but I thought I'd better do it before we go live. And uh, just wish I hadn't, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I'm still happy. There's still things, like little things I'm picking up on that are just annoying me even more. And, um, you know, the fact that going into the next game that there's 1,600 random folk off the street bothering their arses to go down uh, on Christmas Eve. So hopefully, uh, you know, things will be a bit better than it was on Tuesday nights because, God, it was just awful. Uh, I'm still not over the heartbreak uh, at the end. Yeah, I know. I think very impressive news coming out of Tawdry after what we saw in the last two games that once again, the support on the road um, it is going to be another sellout and just probably showing um, how much the club means to us as fans and, well, maybe questioning how much the team currently deserve that level of support after what, after what we've witnessed as well. But especially at the time of year, given the early kickoff time, I know um, you're leaving at quarter to eight from Aberdeen to, to get down. Uh, I know you're delighted about that prospect, but uh, it's the things we do. It is. It is indeed. Uh, me amongst many others, and then, um, you know, what, what, what could possibly go wrong? An away game against Jim Goodwin's former club uh, when we've sold out our away allocation. Oh, God. I don't even want to think about it before, until we've talked about the, this pre previous shit show. <laughs> yeah, this pre and that's not the previous episode you're speaking about, of course. That is a, um, which has had quite a fantastic reaction, um, especially here on, on YouTube. So thank you to all of you that have generated comments on the on the video because I know there was quite a lot of opinion based on um, Saturday's performance and I'm sure there's going to be quite a lot of opinion coming in in the comments um, tonight so um, for those catching up on this episode on audio hopefully you enjoy the debrief that we're going to go through and I think it's going to be quite extensive um, as well because there's definitely a, a lot to, to get through and um, Calm, it's maybe not the best thing, you know, we like to look back at every game um, and preview and I think we're the first Aberdeen podcast to put our heads above the so-called parapet and, and break cover and, and dissect what happened, so God help us and God help you tuning in as well. Oh yeah, absolutely, I mean, it, it won't be a smooth ride and hopefully at the end of it we'll feel a bit better getting some stuff off our chest, but I suppose we'd better get stuck into it, maybe. Yeah, seatbelt. Two, two changes to the team from Saturday. Liam Scales, as widely expected, came in to replace Jack McKenzie, who I thought can count himself very unlucky um, to have seen himself drop to the bench. You know, get yourself man of the match in um, the, the previous game and then find yourself back on the bench. But um, as Ian Watson said to me, maybe put the man of the match in inverted commas because um, with how the game went on Saturday and then no Matty Kennedy missing out uh, on the match day squad altogether which saw a return to the um, starting lineup for Jaden Richardson what could possibly go wrong there eh Callum I know I bet you were delighted about that one eh yeah yeah well I was delighted for about 95 minutes <laughs> and then it yeah. went oh so horribly wrong yeah me too but I do I do feel for Jack uh, I did think he performed well against Celtic and I thought he did actually okay when he ended up uh, coming off the bench as well but um, yeah, I suppose. Wow. I, I, well, I thought he did. I thought he did okay. He wasn't at fault by the goals, really. He could have stopped the cross from Tillman, but <sighs> yeah, well, it got even worse after that. But <laughs> yeah. we'll come on to that. And uh, yeah, Mike Kennedy, uh, fit enough to enjoy the tennis. Hope he didn't uh, aggravate whatever it was that was bothering him any further. Mm -hmm. uh, good for him getting along. Uh, but yeah, Jaden Richardson coming in. I mean, so called. Uh, he's more of a defender than than Matty Kennedy, but. Uh, you know, it's sort of six and a half a dozen really at this stage, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think we saw um, on Saturday against Celtic who the better defender is out of the two of them. 
Um, again, it was another debate. Um, I tuned into BBC Scotland on the way home from the game on Tuesday night, and it was kind of the argument Willie Miller was having, saying, you've signed the guy who is supposed to be a defender, but his best attribute is going forward, which leaves the back three horribly exposed. Um, I didn't actually think, though, we were that exposed down Jane Richardson's side uh, on Tuesday night. It was just down to just some general poor defending. But yes, I'm glad a lot of the players managed to enjoy the tennis at Tekka last night. It was very hard to contain myself when Messrs, Stewart and Rose walked in a few rows in front of me. But quite ironic, though, given three games later, Anthony Stewart was in the wrong seat. Because it's pretty fucking ironic when he's always in the wrong place in our defence just now. Very true. And I hope uh, someone was carrying Kel Rose's drinks. We want any more spillages, shall we? Dream? No, we definitely wouldn't. How did you think we started the game, though, on Tuesday night, Callum? Because we've often been critical about how slow we've started the games at Pataudry. And I actually didn't think we kind of started the game all too well, personally. Um, I thought we kind of allowed Rangers just to ease themselves into the game a, a lot of kind of free space. I was maybe expecting more of a reaction to the way we, we played on, on Saturday. Yeah, I think so. It sort of <laughs> looked sort of kind of much and such the same, albeit perhaps not defending quite so deep, um, mm. um, which would have been very concerning so early on. But yeah. it still wasn't great. And Rangers allowed well, I thought, a lot of time on the ball throughout the whole of the first half. And then also in the second half, even when we were on top, they were allowed to just try and slow things down and sort of take control of things a little bit, keep the tempo nice and low, which probably suited them more, um, sort of being at our place, uh, yeah. which I don't think helped a- at all um, whatsoever. And, you know, certainly things are going to have to be different going out of St Mirren with, with how we start off. But it wasn't wasn't convincing whatsoever. And, you know, not before long, we were punished for uh, being pretty slack. Yes, and pretty slack. And our defence are two things that seem to go hand in hand this season. A wonderful assist from Anthony Stewart into the chest of Fashion Sakala. Maybe some question marks around handball, which VAR quickly diminished. Um, saw the um, Ranger striker put the ball past Kyle Rose to put the away side 1-0 up. And really, I thought, oh, fucking hell, here we go. Um, this is going to be a long night. But, you know, credit to the boys in the Red Shed who, <clears throat> you know, that core group of the the ultras I thought were relentless all night in terms of generating an atmosphere, and um, certainly in that stand, but also the players as well, because you know, given the way Saturday went, it could have been quite easily for fans and players alike to drop the heads and go, Oh Christ, here we go again. But I actually thought there was a, a really good reaction to, to going behind, and then um we realized that if we actually got the ball and ran out of the Rangers defense, they were there to be got at. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know why that took them so long when they could have just, well, surely they'd watched at least some of the Hibs game uh, <clears throat> prior uh, yeah. in their preparation, which bit of a concern, but they were there to be got at, absolutely. And I do have a gripe that I will come on to a little bit later on, however. Uh, and I was, they would have been re- did react okay, but probably after Morelos had his chance was more when we sort of reacted better. And I think that was also another boot up the arse, whereas this game could be out of sight if we don't buck yeah. up our ideas. And I suppose th- that that we did to somewhat of a degree before we eventually equalised. Yeah, and, you know, we had chances. Uh, Duke hit the outside of the, the post, and I think there was a, a long check for handball from James Tavernier. Now, I don't know, as I've literally not brought myself to watch the highlights. Was that shown in the highlights that you watched? It was shown, and it looked um, it looked more like shoulder to me. It's hard to tell. It seemed like in that game there was a lot of very nearly handballs, yeah. uh, which was very very frustrating. Um, but I just, I, for me, probably would have been harsh. Would have loved to have got it at the time. Mm. I thought eh, maybe, but didn't have a great angle of it. And the replay does show. I think it, it is. It's certainly very high up his arm. If it's not his shoulder. Yeah, um, but we could have been doing with it, mind you. Yeah, yeah, we could have also been doing with Yilva Ramadani finding the target as well. Um, quite inexplicably finding the outside of the post when it was definitely easier to get the ball on target. I mean, I think it was quite impressive he managed to clip the outside of the the post, not even hit it full on. And I, I just mm-hmm. thought, is this a sign of things to come? Is it going to be one of those nights for us in front of goal, conceding early, and then? being bitterly unlucky after what we witnessed on Saturday. But 
I guess it was a sign of our intent that was to come up to about the 65th minute. <laughs> yeah, possibly. I mean, one thing that, that was evident from that chance, well, two things. First of all, should have scored. I think everybody knows that. But also, the fact he actually got up in support of the of the forward players compared to Celtic, where, I mean, he was virtually anonymous and yeah. sort of likewise Clarkson and Barron in terms of getting forward and, and supporting the front two uh, or the wing backs, whoever. And um, it, that that for me was was evident. There was seemed to be a more willing, more of a willingness to get forward and, and take that chance and be brave and, and and try and go for it. Unfortunately for him, well for us rather, it fell to Ramadani. Uh, absolutely not a goal scorer, but hit the target and he probably scores from that range uh, with the power he could generate on it as well. But oh god, it, it was certainly I think that also buoyed the crowd a little bit more. And we thought, all right, we're actually in this game now. Yeah, well, especially after watching 90 minutes of us defend um, yeah. a few days earlier, it showed that we did have intent. But yeah, interesting point from Jonathan Main about how the SPFL changed the way VAR is applying the handball rule. All I'm going to say, I think it depends what teams are involved. Judging by recent weeks, we saw obviously the decision that Hibs didn't get yeah. uh, on Thursday night. And then uh, I know there was question marks um, around the winner uh, as well with it mm. coming off Connor Goldson's arm. But um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say on that matter. Um, sure, that'll be good clickbait later when the Rangers fans finally find this video, I'm sure. Yeah, but not, not that I'm bitter. But what did you make of the, the front two? Um, because, you know, Duke has said hit the post mm. uh, in that first half. And I thought once again, he looked to cause um, defences problems. Um, we've had a couple of Rangers fans commenting on some previous videos that we've done on Duke stating how impressed they were by his performance, which is obviously a bit worrying um, when there's definitely going to be suitors coming in and about. Um, Don't you even suggest it? I dare suggest it, no. Um, I think I would top myself if that happened. Uh, having him ripped off the top of my Christmas tree was bad enough. Oh, no! <laughs> Yeah, that and to make things worse, that was also on Tuesday night as well. Um, so if things couldn't have even got worse on Tuesday, to come home and find him and not on top of the Christmas tree was terrible. But um, how how did you view the partnership with him and Majowski, um on Tuesday night? Underwhelming, uh, similar, pretty similar to the Celtic game. Uh, Duke causing some problems when he's been allowed to, and he's got support as well uh, when he's been able to take the ball in and. And, and get running up players, which has basically been the case for most of this season. And yeah. Mjolski, pretty anonymous, as Jeff Moran said there. <laughs> Boy, I'm pretty anonymous, apart from winning the Duke free kick. And that's basically the case. He looks off the pace, pretty ineffective. And I know he's sort of, he can be a bit of a penalty box player at times. Um, and service certainly been lacking in the last two games. But still a little bit more concerning about more of his like link up play and more mm. lack of hold up play and just not being in the game at all. And uh, but we certainly suffered when we lost both of them, which we will also come on to later on. So stay tuned for that. But um, <laughs> Boyan, hopefully getting back up to speed, maybe I don't know. It, it, it is a bit of a concern. He did, at both games, he has looked absolutely ruined to come about the hour, hour mark. Yeah, we're we'll come on to that aspect of it around the hour mark because I don't think it's just been him that, that's looked like that after the hour mark. I want to come on to that bit a little bit later, but a lot of people have, you know, maybe defended Boyan for some of the work he does off the ball in terms of dragging defenders, which then creates the space for Duke. But I didn't really see that on Tuesday. And likewise, I know obviously the game plan on Saturday previously was a, like slightly different, but yeah, I was a bit disappointed in Boyan, and I don't know if the the cramp that um, that he had from Saturday maybe played a part as well. But you know, even in some of the chasing down, I mean, Duke's worth that work ethic seems to be there. But I just thought Boyan was a bit sluggish in terms of maybe looking to to chase down the ball, and and that for me kind of frustrated. And the point that we just discussed from Jeff there, I, I actually turned around when Boyan won the free kick, and I said that's the only thing or the best thing he's done all half. It was really the only thing I actually remembered him doing in that half. And pretty much the whole game, basically the only thing I remember him. In fact, across the two games, possibly. Yeah. Uh, other than losing the ball several times against Celtic. But hopefully he, he will get back to sharpness. I suppose, you know, a big long break and 
coming in. And also the type of player he is, service up to him is absolutely essential. Um, and also having supporting players around him uh, certainly didn't happen against Selig. So a bit more of that against against um, against Rangers. But it's a bit of a concern and hopefully he can get back to, to scoring ways. And it is also just a bit of a concern given the you know rumours of players... Uh, you no know, scouts being being up to watch him and things like that. Are, are things going to his head? What is he thinking? Mm. And also, are they going to bloody take Duke with him, which would be even yeah. bigger disaster to be honest at this stage. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. Especially when he bangs in a free kick like he did um, in that manner in a televised game, that's going to then attract thousands of views on top of that. I mean, what a moment that was for those of us in the stands, let alone. Um, the young Cape Verdean, but I mean, we just can't help but fall more and more in love with him mm. when he does moments like that. I, it's just a crying shame it counted for nothing in the end. Yeah, I mean, two well, Duke's, Duke's best two goals have counted yeah. for essentially nothing this season, which yeah. is nice. But he Criminal. himself is absolutely brilliant, and I'm yeah, as you say, falling more in love with him every day and you know when Boyan came in and he started scoring I was all about him but now it's 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 the Duke show baby um you mentioned you know pe- pe- loads of people watching the goal being shared elsewhere it's even been shown on in Portugal thanks mm. I know that thanks to his Instagram on Sport TV Portugal so I don't know what's going on there but um you know good for him it was a fantastic strike I thought he was absolutely going to go to McGregor's left because it looked like there was a yeah. good scoring chance there because there was such a massive gap and uh, McGregor then sort of took one step to the left. But regardless, what a strike that was. Even if he, like, his positioning was relatively okay. That was the keeper's side. And initially I thought, that's a howler. But it's actually just an unbelievable strike. And it goes into the side netting. Yeah, Alan oh, his little hands. Yeah, that's true. It's like Jordan Pickford. Um, yeah. And f- sort of sparked fantastic scenes at the fence uh, as well, which I thoroughly enjoyed. But ultimately, we... Uh, that came to bite us, but it encouraging again from Duke. And also, I think that, that him taking that on uh, when Clarkson's already scored one early in the season, mm-hmm. I think that just shows the, the sort of confidence and state of mind he's in right now and really enjoying his football. And it just, just <clears> seems, <throat> some seems such a cheeky chappy. It's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah, at least you can smile through through this. Um, do you think it was a deserved equaliser based on the, the play? Um, yes, mainly based on... Ramadani's chance, which, which he should have scored. I think for mm. us to get the goal going level, certainly because although Rangers end up winning the game, that's largely more due down to our downfall, and they weren't very impressive at all. No. Um, and then they still won, so just I suppose what does it matter? But I think so. I think it was certainly deserved. I mean, in terms of Rangers' mm. chances, they'd um, I think Fashion Sakala hit one over the bar in the first half, and there was the save from Morelos. Uh, Morelos is shot. Other than that, I don't remember too much. And given Ramadani's glaring opportunity, I think a, a goal was absolutely deserved. And if it was going to be anyone, it was going to be Duke, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, I suppose, as Jonathan says, you know, people like myself will slag Alan McGregor off for not saving that. But you have to also tip your hat to the quality in Duke because I think you're right. I also thought the space that Alan McGregor was affording his left hand side. I even thought it kind of opened it up for Leighton Clarkson to kind of go round the wall. Um, there was a lot of su- um, bit there, but the way Duke lined it up and obviously fools McGregor into taking that step and then still getting that whip pace. And it, it re- that requires a lot of skill mm-hmm. um, to get that up over the wall and into the side net and, and just, yeah, just another one for his own highlight reel as well, but uh, and make us fall further in love with him as well. But We continue to almost where we left off in that second half, really kind of Mm. taking the game to Rangers. And, you know, you kind of touched on that in the the review of the Celtic game, how it was kind of going to be frustrating that no doubt we would kind of turn up and show that bit more intent on on Tuesday night and maybe pose some question marks why we couldn't play like that against Celtic. Um, I know Andrew Postacoglu doesn't like the two teams being compared to similar, but if we look on our own point of view, it just shows what we are kind of capable of doing when we're on it. And that's something we have been, you know, praised towards Jim Goodwin in terms of what we've done from an attacking point of view this season. Mm-hmm. We can cause teams problems. It's unfortunately at the other end of the pitch that is is where the problem lies. But 
Rangers looked vulnerable when we ran mm. at them. And again, it, it proved to be their downfall with a good attack. And Leighton Clarkson, the man doesn't score tap-ins, does he? Absolutely not. Uh, fantastic technique. I mean, first yeah, for Duke's goal, he showed brilliant technique from, from the dead ball. Clarkson to take it like that and put it past McGregor was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I ended up getting clocked directly in the eye amid the celebrations because I didn't move quick enough to the fence. I just was a sort of stampede. Uh, so that was a bit of a disaster. But it was a um, brilliant technique. I think probably deserved based on how we started that second half. Uh, absolutely. My one gripe, um, was that we didn't swap Duke and Miofsky. Duke was still sort of on that left-hand side, our left-hand side uh, of the two, whereas James Sands was, I always call him another name, uh, was playing left centre-back for Rangers on a yellow card. Uh, and I thought if Duke switches over and runs at him, we could be onto something there, whether he you know yeah. forces him into making a clumsy challenge or he can't make a challenge and we're able to cause them problems, which... But I mean, I mean, we we got the goal anyway, and I just thought we could have we could have maybe exposed that a little bit more. But um, what do I know? Just a random person on the street. But yeah, regardless, I thought we got the matter. goal. Pardon? Whose opinion doesn't matter? It doesn't to matter. Manager. No, it doesn't matter. Apparently, we pay your wages, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> um, on Leighton Clarkson, not just his goal. What did you make of his performance um, for over that sixty-five minutes? Because. I've certainly on this show been critical of what Leighton Clarkson can offer apart from the odd wonder goal. Um, but I thought for me, that was by far his best performance in an Aberdeen shirt. On Other Tuesday. than his set piece that didn't get piece past the near post, which really annoyed me. Um, <laughs> but no, I would agree. Yeah, and I certainly think when he went off, I obviously forced off once again, basically, uh, we certainly suffered a lot. The way he sort of controlled things and was a little yeah. bit, uh, you know, a creative spark using his technique, which obviously has been developed from coming through at Liverpool. And I, I thought he was very good. And I really hope he is fit and available because uh, for, for Saturday, because although, you know, often in Scottish football, a lot of it comes down to physicality and, and work rate. Mm -hmm. Even though he is quite slight, he doesn't shy away from that either as well. Yeah. Uh, as well as obviously having be, be very technically gifted. And I think him going off was a real, real, real blow. Yeah, especially when you don't replace him with another centre midfielder. But we'll come on to that shortly. What did you make of the other two midfielders? Um, there was a lot of debate um, on our Twitter feed um, after the, the Celtic game, kind of sparked by um, someone saying that Conor Barron kind of escapes any criticism Mm -hmm. um, for some of his performances that are maybe not up to standard or maybe they haven't been as good as what they were last season. Um, I think it's fair to say his head's maybe elsewhere. Um, you know, as, as time goes on, the less confident I am of him signing a new contract. I don't know if you feel the same. Yep. But but what did you make of Conor Barron? Because in that first half, um, he was making a lot of silly fouls. Um, which obviously resulted in them then getting booked. But I just felt he was also another player. Um, and actually, I had a tweet saved for half time until Duke scored. That I was going to say we were definitely carrying a couple of passengers in that yep. team in the first half. Boyan was one of them that I had, and I had Connor Barron as my second passenger in that team. Um, for yeah, so for me, I just just thought he was just a little bit off it in that first half. He has sort of been this season. To be honest, I think his head absolutely has been turned. His contract expires in 2024, am I right? Or is it? It's not this season, is it? I'm it's sure it's 2024. Yeah. Um, but also for him, I, I, right now, where would he be going? I mean, right now, who, what team would he improve? I don't think he'd even improve like Hearts. And, and that's in our league. And he's surely got loftier yeah. ambitions than that. Yeah. I just, he needs to get his head back in the game. I know. You know, the first two games to come back after after the break is difficult, and he obviously was coming back from injury as well mm. uh, prior to that. But he needs to, if he's going to be going anywhere, to make it anywhere worthwhile, he needs to start <laughs> performing in an Aberdeen shirt first and foremost. But I don't understand this because that's the, kind of the second player, and this is not I'm not against you. Um, just to make clear that it, it's the second player you've said, oh, they're struggling. You know, second game back. Why are our players struggling two games back after a fight? Any friendlies? 
well, I think that's very much evident. But also, you know, I, I see people questioning strength and conditioning, which we'll, we'll come on to mm-hmm. um, shortly as well. But do you think as we kind of go on, we head towards January, maybe there might be a couple of clubs um, interested in Connor Barron. Do you think he'll stay or do you go? I think he'll stay because right now I don't see where he goes, to be honest. Um, I, I don't see what sort of level he, of team he improves right now. When, But that's obviously based off recent performances. Uh, if he plays the way he can, absolutely, he can go on and become a, a, a very good player, probably too good for us and w- would, have, would leave eventually. But he needs to get his head back on and focus and for, also get us a transfer fee, most importantly, yeah. a good one at that. Yeah. Um, I, I hope he doesn't uh, leave in summer because I think we could uh, in in January. I'd like to be able to hold on to him uh, until the end of the season. Also, just in terms of if we are going to be losing players, that's just a better time to do it rather than mm. mid season. And especially when out with the three that start, but we don't have another centre fielder available right now. So um, hopefully yeah. he stays and hopefully he gets performing again. Most importantly. Yeah, and a couple of comments coming in around Connor Barron, the one on screen just now from Colin Miller saying, um, another one that hasn't been good for a while, possibly we overrated him. And Skolsker then following up saying, are we expecting too much from Barron given he's just broke through? So is there kind of a, is he kind of in between that being overrated and maybe given he's a local lad, because I know how much you rate local lads in these sort of fixtures. um, is Is there an expectation on Connor Barron's shoulders with just breaking through? If they know what a row he is, they'll do for me. Um, possibly, it's a sort of a combination of the both. And I think because of how much better he looked last season compared to this season, when we were struggling so much and when he sort of just broke in, perhaps we got a little bit excited, uh, a bit too excited. And yeah, he is young. I mean, he's not going to you know, change the games against Silicon Rangers at all just by him performing. It requires a lot more than that. But I would just like to see him sort of get back to how he was doing last season. Okay, he was in a worse team and things like that. So maybe he, that's why he shone a little bit of above the rest. But the, he's clearly capable. And he's been involved in Scotland youth setups for as long as I can remember seeing him in the squads yeah. anyway. And I just I just like to see him get back to form. And if he is being distracted elsewhere uh, by, by rumours of elsewhere or his agents in his ear, um, or maybe it's the fact the contract's not been ironed out. I suppose there's also that. And it could be that, but just getting him back to performing would be fantastic. Yeah, um, and I suppose uh, Jonathan Main saying he's got the potential to be as good as Lewis Ferguson, but obviously quite a bit off that at the moment. Needs to get his head down and work like Lewis did, and I think that's a that's a kind of a fair point. You look at what happened when Lewis Ferguson had all his transfer rumours go about. He just put his head down and worked away. Um, if any of you have caught the podcast that that he did. Um, I think it's um, recently we shared it on our Twitter page. He kind of spoke about that, how he just knew he had to get his head down and, and just kind of work. Um, someone who maybe needs to get their head down and work on tactics and mentality, uh, to quote Jonathan in, in the comments previously, is Jim Goodwin. Because our mark, you're 2 and up at home to Rangers. Leighton Clarkson goes down with an injury, a cramp yet again. Um, understandable substitution. Um, him coming off. Johnny Hayes comes on, but at the same time, Boya Miofsky goes off again. Personally, uh, I wasn't too disheartened with that because I thought he was absolutely useless. Um, but Duke went off. What the fuck were we doing? I, I genuinely do not understand that thought process because even taking all three off at that time, we could have slowed the game down and tactically mm. used substitutions at, at times as well. I, I just didn't understand the decision to take all three off. Absolute criminal. <laughs> it really was. I mean, Jim whilst, <laughs> yeah, whilst, whilst we do have deep, better depth and certainly some in the league, we're in a decent position with that. You know, you see teams in England like Man City, if they can make three changes, it's perfectly like for like. But if you take Duke off, and Miofsky, which Miofsky probably had to come off, and put Marley Watkins up there. It's quite the downgrade when Duke's been our biggest scoring threat in recent times. He's the most likely to make something happen out of nothing. 
And also, we're 2-1 up at home against Rangers. Why would you dare make a triple change and change like uh, well, uh, almost a third of the outfield team that has got us in that position? I'm absolutely ludicrous. It, it, ludicrous. It's criminal and it cost us the game. They were all at sea. They had no idea what they were doing. They were awful. And then yeah. that changes things completely. And Marley Watkins isolated up there by himself. Yeah. And he's not even an out-and-out striker in the first place. Oh, awful. Yeah, and I absolutely agree. The only acceptable reason for taking Duke off would have had to be an injury. Yeah. I mean, sorry, yeah. if you are putting... Marley Watkins goes on. Him up there with Duke, absolutely fine with that because Watkins can cause problems. You play him off Duke and his physical battle and things like that as well. That's fine. But up there by himself, hopeless. Yeah, I just, I didn't understand it. And um, Scott Johnson, I know you commented this a while ago, but we were coming to it. Um, and he put in what the hell is happening with Vicente Bazawin because I, I, I still don't understand. Now, I know you want to maybe defend him slightly because um, you said he wasn't that bad. But Shaden Morris coming off the bench um, to replace Duke. Another one I just didn't understand. A player that's hardly seen any minutes this season um, suddenly gets trusted to help us mm. see out a game against Rangers when, uh, again, if just for me, because it's the Park Thistle game that sticks out, he could barely be bothered tracking back in that game. And, and we had a couple goal advantage in that game. I just... That one, yeah, I'm still, I'm still furious about it. I really do not understand why. Now, this makes this is the point I was literally about to make from school square. Goodwin refuses to play people he did not sign. It's pathetic. I mean, there's a lot of calls for something in fact by me after setting <laughs> game. Once we go one 0 down, throw on Basal and Ramirez. See what happens. What's the <clears> worst <throat> that could possibly happen? Yeah. Bissawan and Ramirez also don't come off the bench against Rangers. Shaden Morris does. He's not proved anything. You know, Bissawan's come in, he scored five goals. Ramirez, before throwing the toys out of the pram or whatever happened, mm. uh, was performing very well for us, and that's without taking penalties and being in a horrendous team. Get that, get, uh, why are they not being used now? Shaden Morris comes <clears> on. He was signed by Jim Goodwin. People mentioned he was stu stubborn and arrogant. Does it look like that? Egotistical. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, again, this one's going to annoy me because obviously uh, I haven't watched anything back, but Paul Donaldson picking up the fact that Red TV were saying that Duke was brought off so he could save energy for the St Mirren match. He's had five weeks off. Surely they do not need to be saving energy. And also, he was a great outball for us. He was running that Rangers defence ragged. They... Clearly, as you said, we're at sixes and sevens. They didn't know how to cope with him. As soon as we took Duke off, that Rangers defence could relax mm -hmm. because Connor Goldson dealing with Marley Watkins was bread and butter for him. Yep. He Connor Goldson could probably deal with Duke in the air, but if you chuck that ball in behind and make Connor Goldson, who's been out for months, run, he wasn't happy with it. Yep. Uh, and we just offered no threat. Uh I see Jonathan Main speaking about the Good Goodwin's in-game management, the implosion at Easter Road, Ibrox, Parkhead, and and then again on on Tuesday, it, it's just, it's not good enough. And we, we spoke about Ross County. You could speak about um, Saturday's game. We're throwing points away. Two one from, up against Motherwell at home. <clears throat> yeah, we turned that game away and then threw it away as well. We're we're giving away points that we shouldn't be giving away which ultimately will cost us. And Dave Cormack will sing from the hymn sheet that Europe is the ultimate goal, but we're shooting ourselves in the foot just now to get yeah. that golden ticket to the group stages right now. And yeah. people will maybe say that we're overreacting, we're being emotional based on what we've just seen. But it's not just based on that two games over the, the last four or five days. It's been all season and we're not learning. Well, I say we, but Jim doesn't care about our opinions. He's not learning. Yeah, I would agree with that. And um, I can look with Shane Morris. I actually thought he came on and I can kind of see in theory what was attempted to happen there. Pace on the counter attack. Uh, I suppose he almost got in behind on, on one occasion, but when it's him and Richardson on that right hand side, they're sort of cut from the same cloth. Whereas very athletic, good going football. 
okay going forward. Uh, and <clears throat> and in terms of defensively and, and technical ability, perhaps not all there quite yet. Very young. We don't know whether they'll, they'll come good or not yet. Yeah. But it, it's just sort of <laughs> leaves you exposed when clearly Richardson an attacking wing back. Clearly, Shaden Morris is a forward. It's concerning. And then, yeah, I mean, Bissawin, nowhere to be seen once again. Um, I saw some people, there was a little bit of chat on him on Twitter about sort of how he's been falling out of the frame. Like something's going on there. We don't know, but he wasn't signed by Jim Goodwin. Maybe he doesn't trust him. Um, but at the same time, he's 21. I know you've been critical of him as well. He's 21. The only way he's going to get better is with getting chances. And certainly in games against like against Celtic, when there's nothing else to lose, what's the point in keeping him on the bench? Yeah, but I've, I've been critical of him, absolutely. But I was still rate him better than Shaden Morris because we know and we've seen what Vinny can offer. Um, I, I just don't understand that decision. Now, we also had Prime Drogba sitting on the bench as well, evening to Gary and co from the ABZ podcast, if they're tuning in. Um, because apparently that's what he's been turning into um, the more and more he stays on the bench. Now, I'm not having a go before anyone gets in our mentions. Um, but there's also been question marks about Christian Ramirez's mm -hmm. lack of game time, whether it's a contractual issue around appearance fees. If he reaches a certain amount of appearances, we're due more money. To be honest, I just think it's Jim Goodwin being stubborn and he's not playing him because of how he's acted. Again, focus on how we played against Park Thistle, but come on, it's probably Jim just being kind. Um, I don't understand, but why he's why he wasn't chosen over Marley Watkins. But <clears throat> similarly, I wouldn't have understood bringing Bizawin and Ramirez on and taking both Duke and Mayovsky off. Yeah. I think taking both of them off at the same time killed the game. Mm -hmm. But... I'm going to come back to recruitment as well because taking Leighton Clarkson off, and this is nothing against Johnny Hayes coming on, Leighton Clarkson coming off absolutely killed us as well because yeah. Leighton Clarkson was that little buzz that we had in midfield, that little bit of energy that was finding that pass to the forwards, tracking back, winning tackles. And we brought Johnny Hayes on and he wasn't really sure what his role was. Yet we had a centre midfielder sitting at right centre back. In a back three. Yeah. Make and I think it. eventually when Colson went off, yeah, then Hayes moves to left back or I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but I remember McCrory ended up in midfield at some point. <laughs> mm -hmm. I remember that much. But it just comes back to that, whether it's you know centre midfield or defensively or whatever. The recruitment still job to be done and I just hope to God that Things are addressed quite quickly uh, in January. I like to think irons are in the fire already and work's being done because there's no reason you can't agree a deal. Look at Celtic, they've already signed a player from Japan and Canada at this yeah, point. Well, uh, ready to come in in January. So, Well, I saw Jim Goodwin was asked that as the last question um, in the press conference today and he was very evasive on, on that question, which um, I wasn't particularly enamoured about. Mm -hmm. But with the other thing that really annoyed me about the substitutions. Now, Jim Goodwin was very sheepish at full time. I'm sure the Rangers fans, if any of you are tuning in, you can fuck off, basically. We'll love that pun. But um, yeah, um, he picked up on the fact that fatigue played a part towards the back end and the fact that both Duke and Majowski were out on their feet. Um, how can these players be out on their feet after 60 minutes, two games back? Boyan didn't even play the full 90. Um, as Jim Goodwin said, you know, the players had played the full 90 on, on Saturday. Boyan didn't. Uh, real question marks have to be asked around these players going off with cramp after an hour already. Mm -hmm. Surely. Yeah, I do agree. I mean, I can understand in terms of the intensity of both of them, both of the games could potentially play into things, but... What intensity from Saturday? Well, OK, in terms of chasing shadows for 90 yeah. minutes, that's probably quite tiring um, and demoralising. But it is, it's certainly concerning, especially since it wasn't even just Clarkson and Miofsky. Against Celtic, especially, a whole bunch of them looked absolutely done uh, About you know, with about half an hour, 20 minutes to go. It's it's a worry, uh, especially you know going into the game against St Mirren. I know we'll come on to it, but they've not played yet. We'll, we'll soon find out how that will affect them. But yeah. it, it's, it's concerning whether it's players not looking after themselves right um, or whether it's to do with the staff not being, you know, Obstruct. on it completely, yeah, on scratch. 
I, I, I don't know, but I hope it's not going to be something we're going to carry on seeing because two very, very important games before the turn of the year and then we've got a semi-final to build up to as well uh, halfway through January. So hopefully they can sort things out by then and hopefully more bodies, I suppose, will help as well. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a big concern as well because you've got two games coming up in short period of time. So recovery time is not great. And a slight concern given that this is St Mirren's first game for six weeks, given that their um, first game back was um, postponed um, mm. at Motherwell due to a frozen pitch. So they should be even fresher going into this game. And like you already touched to at the top of the show, hungrier um, given who they're playing um, mm. or certainly who's in the dugout. I'm sure their fans will be very much up for it. Um, this weekend as well so for me that's a concern and then we always know what comes when you go to a plastic surface with players that are carrying knocks or have previous injury problems that maybe affect their performance or ability to play on these pitches so again that worries me um also worries me that we've now got two away games coming up but yeah um, it's a lot to worry about just now um <clears throat> what did you make as well then of the decision once those substitutes were made to go back and sit in and defend the lead. Do you think Jim Goodwin put a bit of maybe too much trust in the players for how well they carried out that job against Celtic and thought, well, well they did it for 87 minutes a few days ago. Surely they can do it for 25 um, last night. But he, he, they did say, I've seen a few folks say he was actually trying to encourage the players to, to get up the park, but... Mm -hmm. Maybe there was just a communication error between players and manager. I'm not. I'm not sure. Possibly. I don't know who the problem comes from there because I think you know, certainly instruction shade in Morris and probably been Johnny Hayes as well. Actually, Marlon Watkins. They're all pretty athletic, pretty quick. Perhaps suggests that's players that will be able to hit on the counter attack. Mm -hmm. um, so that would suggest not just sitting in and similar to Celtic. But if, if it's not from coming from his touchline, then it's the players that are going deep and uh, and deeper and deeper and deeper towards their own goal and inviting the pressure on. And I get, you know, Rangers sort of picked up the intensity. They had a couple of chances. I mean, Arfield could have had four in total, mm. uh, to be honest. Uh, Scott Wright perhaps could have prodded one home that went, that was um, hooked clear, basically, by, yeah. by McCrory, yeah, I think yeah. it was. Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, it is a worry. I suppose when you look at how we dealt with things, you know, against Ross County as well, get we get a late goal to go in front and invite things on, defensive issues, because clearly things aren't up to scratch uh, yet either, which is a bit of a concern after, what, 17 league games, is it, yeah. uh, this season? It, it, it's very, very frustrating. And, we'll, I mean, we'll come on to the seven minutes added on as well. Jesus Christ. Well, I, I was actually going to come on to that next. Were we our own worst enemy in getting that seven minutes added on? It, there was obviously a lot of substitutions throughout the game, but there was a couple of incidences where uh, Willie Miller picked up on it. And I remember saying it at the time, Keller Rose went down clutching his back after making a save. Now, whether or not he did, now I'm this, I'm not having a go at Keller here, whether he did genuinely tweak something yet. yet yeah. Um, whether he did genuinely tweak something or whether it was a bit of time wasting, there was a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. And that, I, again, I turned to Ian and said, we both said this is going to cost us because that's a good two minutes that's wasted. And lo and behold, we ended up like a World Cup game, yeah. finding seven minutes at the end. I mean, if you're looking in terms of how they were doing it at the World Cup, and if that was to be implemented elsewhere, seven minutes probably right. But my main gripe is the inconsistency between getting four minutes against Celtic when we have pigged it the whole game, been <laughs> wasting time since the eighth minute, as you noted, with Keller Roos telling the ball boys to slow down, and that carried on throughout. You know, substitutions, stoppages there in that game too. Um, and, in fact, did we make did we make three substitutions in total or four against Celtic? Was Morris mm -hmm. coming on the fourth substitution or the third? Regardless, they were individual stoppages as mm -hmm. well as, you know, whereas we uh, made three at once, Ranger made three at once. You made four um, at once, actually. Yeah, so it... it, it it's just the consistency that was the real issue for me. I expected four, five to come up, but I mean, I suppose we could have still could have conceded ironically if it had been five. But <laughs> I just it's the consistency for me. Either you've got to 
do the right thing in terms of adding the correct amount of time or stick with your usual shite. Pick one. Don't dick about. Yeah, but it's Scotch football and referees. We know there's no consistency. Oh, right. The most painful part of the evening. Well, no. Um, funnily enough, as well, like I was speaking about the ball boys as well, and even they were trying to do their level best. I remember Alan McGregor was trying to take a goal kick with about five minutes to go, and even um, they were not forgiving the ball back. Um, although I know Paul Donaldson said earlier in the comments that um, there was an instance um, when Rangers were attacking that they got the ball back very quickly. So let's see some more consistency on that. But again, not that it helped overall, but <sighs> injury time then. 93 minutes, you're thinking we're finally going to end that six-year wait for a home win over Rangers or Celtic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ah, Aberdeen, hold my beer. Literally, in my case, I suppose, tonight. Um, Shaden Morrison putting the ball out for a goal kick in injury time when it's still 2-1. Thanks, Paul. I really totally forgot about that, so yeah. that makes me feel a lot worse now. Um could have helped run down the clock a bit if he just took it to the corner. I did actually, I do remember now he says that, um, that, and I did think, why are you going into the box? Why are we not going into the, the corner? But again, you look at who he brought on. Is there a bit of inexperience there? Yeah, um, possibly. I also wonder if he was trying to win something, uh, be it well, presumably a corner as well, I guess, but still didn't go very well. Yeah. And, this one, similar to Cameron Carter-Vickers at the weekend, Connor Goldson being allowed to walk with the ball up to our box was bloody criminal, as Jonathan says. And, yeah, and Skokes are, well, that's the rage back up. This one is hard to take. We're not even at the winner yet. But two minutes to go, a shot mm-hmm. from outside the box, mm-hmm. straight at the keeper, mm-hmm. and... Honestly, I could have, I could have said something to him last night. I was that angry when I've seen him. How how he doesn't hold it, I still don't know. Jim Goodman <sighs> blaming a bounce in front of him. I yeah. mean, I still think he's got to be holding that. A, I want to say a better keeper saves it. I know someone said to me, Joe Lewis saves it. Um, I. And this is why I've seen a, a few people say their jury is still out on Keller right. because he ha- he did make some good saves. And I thought, yeah. by and large, last night, he was actually, uh, sorry, Tuesday night, he was actually quite commanding. There was yeah. a few times the ball came into the box and he was out collecting it and killed it. Down on it. But the problem is when it was straight at him, I was like, oh, here we go. And Jim Goodwin came out and said, well, should have actually been he was more looking at his defenders and the closest defender was Jaden Richardson whose anticipation or reaction to Keller spilling the ball was not that of Scott Arfield I kind of see where Jim's coming from but to be honest I'm expecting my keeper to do better yeah I mean I watched it back I knew at the time it took. It did take like a. It sort of dipped. I can't remember if it hit the ground just before or it hit the ground as he's trying to claim it, mm-hmm. which does make it difficult. I think, you know, top goalkeepers probably hold it, but even then, you still see them sometimes spill it. I think there maybe has to be a decision where he sees the way the ball's moving, commit to batting it. Why get it out? Just get it out rather yeah. than try and take it and then not end up taking it, not be able to react quick enough. If he just commits to trying to beat the ball wide. Perhaps we get away with it, um, and yeah, I mean, it was the this, this thing I messaged you actually as soon as I watched the replay of the goal. Scott Arfield, the only one mm-hmm. on their on his toes, ready to get in there yeah. and and deal with a potential rebound, and he does. He puts it away. I mean, I think Richard, uh, I think Stuart was there as well. But the the regards is yeah. there's three, four of them just letting Arfield run in, get there and prod it home and victims of our own downfall once again who's shocked but horrendous all round and you know if one thing goes done differently perhaps it doesn't happen but we've said that many a time this season as well it just seems to be a catalogue of errors yeah and whilst you're finishing there Jonathan main comment into literally taking the words out of my mouth we put all three of their fucking goals on a plate for them to quote him 
And that for me, as you were speaking there, again, just brought all that rage back from Tuesday because realistically, they didn't have to work for that three points. They will not score a more comfortable three goals. They will not be gifted an easier three goals from a team at a venue like a Pataudry, a Tynecastle, a Parkhead. Until the split. We, we've literally just handed it to them. Mm-hmm. And a game where we had them rattled, we had them against the wall, we've somehow come away with not even a point. Absolutely inexcusable. Some would say sackable. Um, some would say disgraceful. Uh, mm-hmm. Enter whatever adjective you want. Um, but I guess, again, when you look, look at injury time, Colin Miller saying... Poor game management by the players, not one of the players educated in the dark art of shithousery. Just look at the way Argentina shithoused some of their games during that yeah. World Cup. I, we spoke about what Ramadani could offer in midfield. I know he was already on a booking as well. Maybe that affected him, but it's just none of those players looked like... And again, it kind of goes back to that point. We kind of spoke after the Celtic game when you hear Jack McKenzie's comment. Did the players ever have any belief that they could beat Celtic? Did the players still believe at 2-1 up that they could win that game? Were the players mentally affected by the change that we then went defensively when we were having so much success? Is there a mentality problem with us when it comes up? And I tell you what, it's really knocked my sense of feeling for the semi-final, although I'll probably change come the 14th of January, but right now it's a bloody thought. Yeah, I think also conceding late against Celtic as well. Perhaps that's that's played on their mind. But regardless, you know they, they've got to just push that out and deal with what the task at hand. And Skoska, again, I'm going to agree with you and bring a comment up on screen. Yeah. Arfield was coming in from the edge of the box a couple of times before <clears throat> this, he scored. Yeah. Still not picked up. Yeah, two other chances uh, which Roos saved. One which he sort of fluffed, but another one, the, the first one I think it was, he forced a very good save from Roos. I don't even think it was a very good save from Roos. I think it was more the fact that either side of Keller, he scores. It, it was more the fact that it was just a really poor finish from Scott Arfield. But yeah, you're yeah, Scott's are absolutely right. We he did no warning. Um, but then when do we ever when do we ever take note of it? And it was so frustrating because the fact that we're sitting here, Callum. And we've not even taken anything from the game. It's actually laughable. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're finding it laughable because I could probably smash this laptop if it wasn't my work one. <laughs> How ridiculous. angry um, I am about it. It. I just don't even know what to say. Jack McKenzie doesn't stop the cross. No. And then Anthony Stewart and Jane Richardson get in each other's way. Probably no communication between the two, but... Come on, man. Why in the 97th minute are you heading the ball back across the face of goal? Who Fuck teaches you that? I, I I genuinely don't even know what to say. I don't um, think there's anything much to add about that goal other than how ridiculous it is that we're going in the 95th minute at 2-1 up and we come away with it after seven minutes added on without anything. And the defending for that goal, the defending for the goals arguably got sort of worse as it went on. Um, so the first one, first car, terrible, obviously. The second yeah. one, goalkeeping's bad, then defending's bad. And then the third one, Richardson and and Stewart both mm-hmm. going for the same ball, end up knocking it down to to Goldson, who yeah. I, I was convinced, absolutely convinced, hand, handled yeah. it. Even in the replays, I'm going... I'm just waiting in it for it to be clear that it's his hand. I actually don't think it is clear at all. I probably didn't hit his arm at all. But it just... uh, definitely, definitely kind of touches somewhere between his elbow and shoulder. A hundred percent. To be honest, it would have been funny if it got chalked off, but I mean, I don't know. It's. I don't know. I don't know. But regardless, even before that, which we've said before, before it gets to that point, we had a chance to deal with it. Flick it on out for a corner, whatever, get set up at the set piece, which, you know, we probably would have conceded from anyway because <laughs> we're rubbish at defending. Um, but, oh, God, it just, it keeps happening. This is meant to be the easy part, Jim. I mean, going forward, sometimes brilliant. We've got good players in there. You know, look at Duke. Miofsky, when he's on his game, 
And then and then and then at the other end, it's just horrendous. I think right back and right centre back, which we've been saying since the end of the window, just before the end of the window, mm. required in January. Yeah. Um yeah, it really is. Um yeah. And you know, I down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um not not good enough at all. Um it's just it's just crazy, and and Skokes are. I don't know if you can bring up the comment, Calm. Um, we're we're just gonna the one he's putting about the stats for Glass and Goodwin, where Goodwin has one more win in the same number of games. We're we're gonna come on to that uh, in a second, but um, as I said, just the seven years now since we beat the old firm at Padre, uh, and I I text you this. It was Ricky Mackey that I think t- uh, tweeted it out that one win in 19 midweek games in our last 19 midweek games is an absolutely shocking stat and fills me with even less confidence given Kilmarnock is a midweek game as well. Uh, That's a big concern. Um, And of course, with the concession of the three goals on Tuesday night, only the bottom three sides in the division have a worse um, goals against um, record than us. So we might be getting all that worse third right now. (laughs) It, it, well, it really is. And the fact that we're actually closer to the bottom of the table than we are second says a lot about the rest of the league as well. Um, but going to the point that Skokes are made, Goodwin says we've made significant progress. He says that in his press conference today. We're only four points better off than we were at this point last season after the same amount of games. So, Callum, have we made progress? Um. Oh, God, that is a very tough one. I think possibly we have, despite the evidence not stating that. I'm certainly enjoying things a bit more this season than we certainly did towards the back end of last season. Um, I think there is good foundations there. Um, Certainly, you know, in terms of Duke, Miofsky, uh, Ramadani, brilliant additions. I just think we need to sort things out defensively. Um, and I think once that is correct and that is fine and that is right, then it's a good foundation to go off. Um, yeah. I didn't expect things to be absolutely perfect so far this season, given how badly last season went. In fact, we are somehow still third, and with a win, we'll be third for Christmas uh, on Saturday. Um, and then with a semi final coming in January, a chance to improve then. I think we are heading in the right direction. I just think. It's a bit slower than I once thought, maybe. Mm. But a possible overreaction, once again, after losing to these two games. But it depends massively on the two away games coming up. I said that they're potentially bigger than, than these two against Celtic. Our season, what we def- defined against results against them as much as we'd like it to be. We'd like to be competing with them for spots. Realistically, it's more the likes of submitted that we're we're competing with right now, and we need to get over that hurdle before we even think about looking at them. So, uh, come back to me on that one after the next two games. <laughs> I, I think though as well, you, you say games aren't our season isn't defined by games against them, but we've thrown away four points over the last two games, and if you look at us against Hearts, Hearts haven't picked up a point at home against Celtic Rangers that would have you know extended our advantage over them we're not we're kind of throwing away points where maybe a team like Hearts wouldn't I I feel Um, and so uh, that might come back to haunt us Um, I am I am worried about Hearts now that they've not got European football and they're starting to get their team back together and that is a bit of a concern but uh, I suppose I've just said, you know, those games aren't defined by, you know, our season isn't defined by playing Celtic or Rangers. Well, we're about to play a team that's taken four points from them at home. So that's exactly. good news. Yeah, um, exactly. We are about to play St Mirren, of course, this weekend. A team who have only lost once at home, uh, and that was on the opening day of the season against 10 men Motherwell in a game that really is still probably, I'm sure, for some St Mirren fans, beggars belief that they didn't take anything from that game. As I said earlier, it's also the first game back in Premiership action for the Buddies, so I'm sure they'll be fresh and raring to go. What are your thoughts ahead of this game, and what are your memories, Callum, of your previous trips to St Mirren? 
Um, I'm trying to rein in the inevitable excitement that always comes in the lead up to an Aberdeen game because after the last two games, I just need to start, I think, reining things in and not getting my hopes up and going and expecting the worst. At least then I'll never be disappointed. Uh, although it's Aberdeen we're talking about, so that's always possible. But they are uh, a side on good form, especially at home. Um, this fans, uh, some fans will certainly be up for it, uh, given you know who who they're up against. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that obviously being Jim Goodwin, and they've got players in their side. Perhaps they need to prove a point as well. I know certainly Declan Gallagher, who was not, you know, he'd argue not treated perhaps best by Aberdeen fans, but we'd argue that he was awful. Uh, so. <laughs> There is that, but it's going to be a tough one, and we need to come out with a fire in the belly. If they've not got it in them to react and use that certainly that last game as fuel to go and put in a performance for the travelling fans who are paying their wages in a cost of living crisis, <laughs> travelling one thousand six hundred down strong at twelve thirty on Christmas Eve, then. You know they shouldn't be here if they if they can't get themselves up for that after a result like that and pick themselves up with the fire in the belly to prove <clears> that they're not a load of bottle jobs. So there's me laying down the gauntlet to you, uh, Messrs Goodwin, etc. Yes, but you are a random person, so your opinion is irrelevant to Messrs. Oh, yeah, sorry, Goodwin. Sorry. But a reminder to those of you currently tuned in, um, Callum, of course, as you said, you are going down. You're part of that sellout crowd that are going down. Um, I will be still at home uh, and I'm getting out of a trip to the soft play on Christmas Eve by staying at home to watch the game. I'm sure I will immediately regret that decision. But of course, it means I can bring you a live reaction at full time. Um, So those of you currently tuned in, if you have not done so already, remember to hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel and maybe as well hit the notification so you're notified when we go live at full time or when I I should say, go live at full time, reacting to whatever happens at Saturday. Um, God help me if it's anything like Tuesday night. Um, Do you have any worries for Saturday? Because Jonathan Main probably has a similar worry to what I have. Um, And I know Ramadani was asked similar, um, as was Goodwin in their press conferences days, how the players pick themselves up for it. Because like Jonathan, I'm still raging. So I'm sure the players and management must still have some after effects in the manner of defeat. Um, Is that a concern for you, Callum? Or should it be fuel to the fire in terms of motivating the players to go and get that victory on Saturday? It's a concern because I don't know if they've got it in them, but it should be fuel to the fire. And uh, as Colin said, I should be giving the team talk after that. I felt like Michael Sheen before he, you know, the wheels went to the World <laughs> Cup. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they, should, they should, they should, if they're in the wrong game if they can't pick themselves up after a result like that. I know it's hard, it's demoralising. They've, you know, lost two goals late on, but they need to go out and prove to not only us, not only the management team, but themselves that they are good enough. You know, they got us to third in the league uh, mm. going into the break. They need to. They need to buck up their ideas, they collect themselves, gather themselves after that and, and, and go again because, well, there's no other option. Games are coming thick and fast. It'll only get worse if they don't do it now. So yeah. don't feel sorry for themselves and get after it. Fly into those challenges. Make things happen. Be direct. Yeah. Don't well, pussy foot about, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. No, say it how it is. And I'm sure with your editing skills, you can quite easily cut up um, your team talk and get that published on Saturday morning. Uh, as part of our preview tweet. Um, Fitness-wise, Jim Goodwin says the boys are in good shape. Uh, I'll believe that when I see it, Jim, based on some of the way the players have been cramping off and the Mm. comment about fatigue. How much pressure, though, Callum, is on us to get the three points after the last two games, with hearts breathing down our neck, with our dreadful away record, and, as you said, giving ourselves that opportunity psychologically, whatever you want to call it, be that team in third place at Christmas. How much pressure is on the Dons this weekend? I'd say lots, um, which is a concern given how we've seen uh, them deal with pressure, big away crowds on the road so far. Mm -hmm. Um, If we come back first three games without, without a point, I mean, three is basically needed, but without even a point at this stage, then 
it'll be uh, an interesting January transfer window, certainly for Dave Cormack as well, whether they decide to you know invest or stick how it is and see how it goes to save him some cash before he gives him the boot. Um, mm. I, I, we we have to win. We have to go down there and win, and not only win. You know, if the football's not perfect, if, the, if it's not pretty football, lots of attacking, uh, then show us a bit of grit and determination that that, that we've not seen certainly against Celtic. Get in amongst them, um, you know, run run around, get into people, just to make yourself mm. feel a little bit better. It's just. <clears throat> I'll maybe message uh, Lisa or Zoe and see if there's an opportunity to get you in the dugout Thank for you. Saturday. Just Thank you. Well, basically, my football manager so far this this year is not going to be worth it, but <laughs> they, they do need to get themselves back up for it and get. I, I mean, if we're going to finish third, these are the games we need to be winning. I know they've been good at home. Yeah, uh, I know we've not been, and also Jim Goodwin said during the break they'll be looking at how to improve things on the road. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how that goes. But after he came up. Uh, with, with that plan against Celtic after five weeks, I've got no fucking belief in it. No. Um, do you make any changes for this weekend then? Yes. Um, part of me wants to go back to the four at the back. Um, I you don't think Jim know, Goodwin's but... ego lets him go back to the four because he would basically have to admit he's got, or <clears throat> sorry, the back three currently is not working. I don't know if he will do it. I'd like to see. I mean, if they're not going to change that, I don't know what they're going to do in terms of changing how we play. Um, I think at times the strikers can be far too isolated uh, in, in the current system. Uh, down the right-hand side in particular, we've seen pretty weak defensively. I don't know whether having wide midfielders up ahead of them maybe helps that. Um, I, honestly, God knows what they do. Um, will Miofsky start at this point? I don't know. Um, no. I'd like to see Vinny at this point, but I know that's not going to happen. It's going to be the same old shite, isn't it? It is, and there will be the same changes um, after an hour, I'm sure, as well. Um, interesting one from yeah, Paul triple Donald. change to ruin everything. <laughs> yeah. Jim Goodwin's had quite a long honeymoon period for a new manager. Do you think that honeymoon period is over after the last two matches or is the period still ongoing I think it mm. was over probably for me anyway after Tanadice. I know he wasn't yeah. in the dugout but that that's when it went yeah. for me yeah um, probably over however as much as I've been very uh, negative about him in this one I would still like things to work out I just think that he still obviously has stuff to learn and the team as well as not quite where they'd like it to be, despite the investment um, in in the summer. Win the next two, and you know they'll all be the greatest players on earth uh, again. And I'll be loving Jim Goodwin. So I'm fickle. I know that, but we need to start seeing improvements away from home. It's as simple as that. My biggest concern about what you just said, though, is the learning factor, and I don't see Jim Goodwin learning. I've not seen it yet this season, but you're yeah. absolutely right. We all which know is, this football. Which is a concern, sorry, when all the information is right there and we can all see it. Exactly. The fact that we can see it and him and his team can't is a concern or they're too stubborn yeah. not to see it and change it. Choose not to. Just shut their eyes. Pretend it's not there. Yeah, I just hope it gets better. What do you expect then from St Mirren this weekend? Um, you expect them to come out and look to take advantage of potentially a fragile Aberdeen after Tuesday? Yeah, I think they'll look to compile the misery and they should have all the confidence in the world that they can do that, given, um, um, first of all, how we've been down there. Uh, oh, you, sorry, you mentioned memories. Um, St. Mirren fans singing Obika when it was pissing down with rain. That's my memory. Uh, yeah, they've got all, every reason to be confident. You know, we, we can be fragile, particularly on the road. Um, we know what they can bring to games. There's not only quality uh, in terms of some of the players in there. I mean, look Keanu Bacchus, for example, but also in terms of they can bring the dog in them. They can really mm. do that and, and they can mix it. And we <laughs> look like we can't do that on the road right now. And after the game, previous two games, for example, submit and get the first goal and then that away crowd turns. I don't have any faith in us mm. getting back into it. Yeah, that's the <clears throat> concern I have as well over the game coming up with it being a sellout and how the previous two games have gone. We know what we're like in front of a big away crowd. 
and it's not like this away crowd is miles away from the pitch as well. We're quite close to the pitch, and I think you're absolutely right. If we concede that first goal early as well, it could potentially get a bit toxic in that away end, I'm sure. Um, so for our own sake, I hope we get that first goal, and I, I hope we don't sit on it. I hope we just try and play to our strengths. Let's not mm. retreat, get that white flag out. As Fitba tweets put out that picture, I still was very much uh, laughing at it. It's probably the only thing I've laughed at in relation to the game. The picture of Jim Goodwood running back and um, with his white flag saying, we're winning, retreat. Um, but uh, uh, certainly if we lose Christmas and New Year is cancelled for me, um, yeah. <laughs> just shut the doors. I'm yeah. done. I'm done. I know, um, I know. But we can but hope. And the problem is it's the hope that kills us. Um, yeah. thank you I guess to you Callum for joining me in this therapy session tonight, thank you to all of you at home who've either had us on your big screens, laptops iPads, wherever you've been tuning in and of course interacting with the show um, these lives build on success for those of you that help tune in and create mm -hmm. some of the content and discussion points as well that I know a lot of you discuss as well in the comments throughout, so big thank you to all of you for tuning in as I said, I will be back at full time on Saturday reacting to whatever happens um, on Saturday lunchtime. Um, please, it can't be much worse, can it, Callum? I know, but we keep saying that, though. We do, but let's hope, and let's hope that, that hope doesn't kill us. Until next time, thanks very much for tuning in to another episode of Red Tinted Glasses.